This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 443 of Horse Tip Daily, a different horse tip, a different equine topic, a different equestrian expert every day. Horse Tip Daily brings the world of equine knowledge to you one day at a time. Today's tip is sponsored by Equestrian Collections for the entire universe of equestrian shopping at your fingertips at a price you can afford. Visit equestriancollections.com. Enjoy today's tip. Hi everyone, Glenn the Geek back with you from Lexington, Kentucky, and welcome back to Horse Tip Daily. Well, we are back here with our continuing series from the horse.com from Horses in the Morning on laminitis. They did a four part laminitis series during the month of April on Horses in the Morning, and we're sharing that with you now. If you missed part one, check back to yesterday's show, episode number 442, and you can hear it there. Uh, Christy West is uh, the one that helps us out uh, from the horse.com on their weekly horse health report. And this is taken off of episode 118 for April 13th, 2011. And this uh, episode is sponsored by Equestrian Collections. Equestrian Collections has all that you're going to need for this spring and summer season. If you're out there showing or if you're just a backyard rider, it doesn't matter. You can find anything you need in the way of clothing and tack and apparel and sheets and blankets and over 300 different brands from equestriancollections.com. Helmets. I mean, one of the things we saw last weekend at Rolex was the Riders for Helmets campaign put on by Lindsay was right down the hall from us, and they had thousands of people sign up for Riders for Helmets uh, for the contest and drawing that they're having over there, uh, giving away $6,500 worth of helmets. And Equestrian Collections is a sponsor of that campaign. So we saw a lot of people buying helmets. But no matter what you need for your spring and summer needs, you can find it at equestriancollections.com. And they have a special coupon for listeners of the Horse Radio Network. It's $10 off your next order of $120 or more. Just type in Horse Radio, all one word, at the coupon section at check out and you'll get that ten dollars off and that's special for the listeners of the horse radio network and horse tip daily so that's equestriancollections.com stop there before you go anywhere else you'll love the selection and you'll love the prices and now part two of the series on laminitis this time every week we have the horse.com that comes on and uh, it's christy usually with um uh, you know, some special guests, and today is no different. She has today with her Katie Watts. And first of all, um, let me say good morning to Christy. How are you? I'm great. And yourself? Oh, doing fine, doing fine. A laminitis month. Uh, le- I like to call it laminitis awareness month. Is that okay? I think that's awesome. Okay, laminitis yeah. awareness month continues here <laughs> on the Horse Radio Network. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently you're not going to gross Glenn out again. I did enough of that We're talking about sheath cleaning. So why don't you tell us what you're going to talk about and introduce your guest, Katie. Hey, Christy, we are the only morning show in the world that can spend an hour and a half talking about sheath cleaning. I just think that's awesome. It's special. It's and special. I that I've been on the phone a little bit this morning and, and, and missed it. I'm going to have to catch the archive for sure. <laughs> yeah, you're going to go to the very beginning of the show. You're going to want to hear that part. Good time. Absolutely. Well, Good time. And I want you to enjoy your, your reprieve from gross because it's coming back in a couple of weeks with a vengeance. I, just want to- I, I got enough watching that baby being born last night on that website that Jamie told me about yesterday that I had to go there. But- I think we can do better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, girl. Yes, I like it. And I'm, I'm I'm just sorry that we can't put video on the radio show, but we can link to it afterwards in the show notes, right? All right. So <laughs> on, to, on to what we're actually talking about today. We wanted to talk a little bit about grass and hay and laminitis because you know more and more horses in this country and in a lot of other places are are overweight and have metabolic problems. And we're going to talk a little bit more about specific, those metabolic problems specifically next week. But this week, we're going to talk about what you can do about, the, about feeding those horses because they do, they do tend to be susceptible to problems like laminitis. And the, the, gra- the pasture grasses and some of the hay grasses in, in, in all over the place have been developed, you know, bred and, and uh, engineered for weight gain in other livestock species in a lot of cases. And they're not really so good for a horse that's metab- that has metabolic problems. So I wanted to bring Katie on to talk to us a little bit about those grasses because Katie has had 
you know, some metabolically susceptible horses in her lifetime, and she is extremely passionate about what they eat, taking a look at what they eat because this is her field. She's a craft consultant. She's a researcher. Um, she literally walks, watch her horses graze out in the field, and they get a little bit sore. She'll run out and grab handfuls of what they've been eating, send it off to the lab, and see what its sugar content is. She's extremely knowledgeable, knowledgeable about this. She's probably one of the few non-veterinarians to be published in veterinary literature on this topic. So, Katie, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, talk to us a little bit about what the, what the what are some of the signs of horses that are susceptible, metabolically susceptible. We'll start with that, and then we'll go into the grass. Okay. Um, when I lecture, um, a lot of people have this misconception that I'm anti-grass. I think grass is, is the perfect food for horses. It's just certain horses that we need to be careful about. Um, uh, a lot, most horses can eat grass in any kind of weather all day long with impunity. I wish I had one. Um, but but uh, well, first of all, we need to, to talk about what horses that that need to have their intake restricted this this time of year um, you can pretty much uh, if you if you know the signs you can tell by looking um, of course the the obese ho horses are at risk but even horses that are in a fairly lean body condition because they've been properly managed for metabolic syndrome still have these subtle signs of a slightly crusty neck or they might have uh, a little bit of fat pad around the shoulder, over the loin, maybe some dimples in their butt. Um, and these are the ones that we really need to be careful for. Uh, of. And, and, of course, they, they will tend to have some rings in their feet. Um, and the other thing that we, we need to be very mindful of is these very subtle changes in, in their soundness. Um, I literally make my ponies trot whenever I open the gate to turn them out in the morning because they're big moving ponies that do dressage. And if they start walking, if they start trotting like a Western Pleasure horse or if they start doing this exaggerated heel first landing and flipping their toes, then I, I start to worry and, and I will bring them back in. Um, so we really need to get mindful, watch these horses, and if they do have these metabolic tendencies, the um, the fat pads and, and actually the hardness in their crest can change literally from one day to the next. So r rather than uh, sit around worrying, you just check. Um, and I, I get into the habit of feeling my pony's neck literally every day and, and checking for changes in hardness and size. So what do you, do you find that if the crest is, is getting a little bit harder, you need to worry more or less? You need to, you, you need to worry more if the, if, the, if the neck gets harder or bigger. Or, or you see no. more of this. Uh, sometimes their neck almost gets corrugated looking. Um, and, and the places where that individual horse puts on fat pads, um, uh, it gets, it's, it's a different kind of fat. It's kind of lumpy. Kind of like, um, like a, a cellulite uh, that we all dread, and you know, women, we yeah. all have it. We can't help it, you know. So that yeah. when, you, when your horse's neck yeah. starts to look like the back of your thigh, uh, <laughs> then yeah. that's when you have to worry about them. Now, I just want to point out metabolic diseases. When you talk about that, uh, give us some examples. Like when you talk about metabolic diseases, are you talking about cushionoid horses, laminitic horses? Can you can you give us a better example? Okay, this is mostly about insulin resistance. And, of course, insulin resistance is a standalone condition in some horses, mostly ponies, uh, a lot of gated horses, Icelandic, uh, uh, Norwegian fjord horses. It, it's a natural genetic tendency. Then obesity can cause insulin resistance all on its own. And then... Some horses with Cushing's, which they prefer to call pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction, may or may not be insulin resistant depending on 
uh, what part of their pituitary is damaged. Um, there are some um, horses with PPID that that are not insulin resistant yet or may never be, and those seem to be able to graze with impunity. Um, so you're, you're always back to um, w looking at the individual horse and how it reacts and being very mindful and vigilant and really staying on top of it during this time of the year when the, the sugar in the grass is especially high. Now let's talk a little bit about that. Why, why at this time of the year are, is the grass high, sugar grass higher in sugar? There we go. Because it's cold. Because it's cold at night, and it's sunny during the daytime. <clears throat> um, why, is it, we, why is that the case? Well, it, it goes back to it's not rocket science. You know, we all forgot our our ninth and tenth grade biology. Um, we got to remember that photosynthesis is makes sugar out of carbon dioxide and sunlight and water, and um, and that is the raw material that grass uses to grow everything else. Um, after the grass makes sugar, it turns it into protein, turns it into fiber, turns it into energy for growth. Well, if it's very very cold at night, the the enzymes that help the grass grow cannot function properly. So if it's below 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 5 degrees centigrade, the grass cannot grow. So it has all these raw materials that it made the day before, but it can't use them because it's too cold at night. So under the conditions when it's sunny during the day and cold at night, the, the the sugar will gradually build up in grass because it can't use the sugars to grow. It's still sitting in the sun every day. It's still creating photosynthesis. It's still creating sugar. The plant just can't use it. So under these kind of conditions, like if you had two solid weeks of beautiful sunny days with not a cloud in the sky and uh, near freezing temperatures every night, then you're going to get a situation where the grass in your pasture, even though it looks the same and your horses are eating the same thing, the, the sugar concentration could double or triple in a three-week period of time. I think that's important for people to realize is that just what you just said, that the grass can look the same or it can even look very stressed and still be very, very high in sugar. I think a lot of times people think that if the grass or their hay looks kind of rotten, it, it, then it must be low in sugar. And actually, I think the opposite is true sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. You can, well, I used to think I could tell by looking, but I can't because every time I, uh, um, I've, tested, I've tested a gazillion samples of grass and I can't tell by looking. Um, it, people, ha you know, I have a whole hour lecture on why I hate that lush word. Everybody says lush grass, and frankly, I don't know what that means. Um, it, people have a tendency to think that if it's brown or if it isn't attractive or if it isn't bright green, then it's safe, and, and that it doesn't really matter. Um, the other thing that is operating during this time of year is, um, a lot of a lot of people with horse pastures have them overgrazed. Um, a lot of t paddocks are considered turnout areas where they're really more like play pens than uh, a pasture for them to get significant part of their diet. So this time of year, they're probably overgrazed. They're probably muddy. People look out from the kitchen window and say, oh, shoot, there's nothing out there to eat. And, and, and so they don't even think about pulling their high-risk horses off. And, and so they turn the herd out there, and the herd is keeping it grazed down to the dirt. During this period of time when the growth rate is increasing, there's a whole lot more grass growing out there, but if the horses are keeping it grazed down to the dirt, they can be doubling their intake rate, but the pasture still looks the same. And so if you're purposely, if, if your pasture is overgrazed 
And I know people sometimes purposely do this because they see grass as the enemy and, and they don't want their horse to have grass. So they think that grazing it down to the dirt is a good thing. But this time of year, that grass is growing like crazy. And your, if your horses continue to graze it down to the dirt, you have no idea how much your horses are eating. Jamie so, just had little convulsions because she, out in Phoenix, she lays down and praises the grass when it grows. Uh, <laughs> you know, she has a little monument set up to growing grass. Uh, so I'm yes. sure she just had little convulsions right there. I sing to it every morning. Okay. If, you, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see how fast your grass is growing, the mint and exclosure, this is what grass researchers do to compare grazed versus ungrazed. Put four panels out there or, you know, put a tiny little fence out there and, and, and so where your horses can't get to it, and then you can actually see how fast your grass is growing. And you know, I actually quite surprising. I, I, yeah, again, I live in, you know, the desert, Phoenix, Arizona, and I actually have planted a tree trying to grow some shade. And um, the third tree after the horses started eating that, I had to put some panels around the tree. And yes, um, there is some growth inside there. No, it's not impressive. So I think I'm okay. Um, but I know what you're talking about with most people because, you know, especially like where Glenn and Jennifer live in Lexington, Kentucky, I mean, you look at that grass the horse says and they get fat so and and potentially i mean i know that jennifer's horse wears a muzzle all day long because he just can't have that kind of food no yeah. bad thing yeah yeah so <laughs> poor baby something that i wanted us to talk about which is okay we've, we've we've got a lot of grass growing it's spring what can people do to try if they've got some of these susceptible horses what can they do to try and make that pasture safer for their horses or maybe they just need to take the horses off well, I spent the I spent the last eight years. See, I spent an incredible amount of money on on planting these. Uh, I have an acre of irrigated grass paddock with with underground sprinklers and a computer time clock and and all this expensive fencing and and I went to a whole lot of trouble to set up a system where I should be able to feed my ponies for six months out of the year. And, okay, and, there must be and, a 12-step program for that. I just say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so now I've got this grass that my ponies can't eat. And I'm, I'm, it, really, it, it really pisses me off. <laughs> and, and so I'm just like bending over backwards trying to find ways that I can manage this grass so that my ponies can actually eat it. I'm a very stubborn woman. <laughs> or I wouldn't have done all of this. You're on you know it, so, let me let me just recommend something to you. Well, you you know you're a, you're a little grass obsessed. You have you know probably need to take some medication, and you know what? Get some dang thoroughbreds or something, and quit worrying about it so much. Oh, you yeah, he's only get oh, insulin resistant oh, ponies. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have a pony that has chronic laminitis and, and can only eat grass an hour a day? Do I have you that? No. <laughs> yes. I think it's really well. cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I think a couple of big percherons ought to do the trick. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that'll help you out. Now, this is all good points, though, and it's something I love the point, and I hadn't really thought about it that way before. I love the point you made about about the dry lot, quote, unquote, dry lot, that people think their horses aren't getting anything to eat. And uh, being a horse husband, I've probably been guilty of that, saying, Jennifer, why do we have to put the muzzle on already? There's nothing out there. And that's a very good point. Yeah. Good girl, Jennifer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and boy, another point that I wanted to bring up is for all it's, it's worth, too. too. Talk about sad faces when I go out there. Oh, man, oh, yeah. is he giving me a guilt trip. <laughs> they don't need eyebrows. Okay. That looks I, I hear this a lot, and ponies have really developed this look, you know, um, it, uh, where mommy, you know, mommy, the mommy dearest look. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I remember when I when I uh, when I switched. Hay, see, I I first foundered my ponies on hay, and when I figured this all out and I found some hay that was low in sugar, I took away their high sugar hay and gave them this this uh, low sugar hay, and they. They they would they peed on it. <laughs> and, 
and, and they would not, and, and, you know, and I said, well, just tough, you know, and it took them about three days before they would taste it, and, um, but they would not eat it in my presence. <laughs> Katie, Katie, you got the you have the best delivery of lines. You you definitely do. <laughs> so 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 but they but it would disappear overnight. So uh-huh. it took literally this thing that saved their lives. Um it literally took them a full week before they would eat it in my presence and they would eat it in significant quantities that I was no longer concerned about them starving to death. And this is a really big problem for a lot of people. Um, the, the, the pony eyebrows are, you know, we just cave in. <laughs> oh, poor baby. Yeah. Um, but oh, it's time yeah. for tough love this time of year. And um, it, when it, going back to the management you know, I've done all of these things. I, I, you know, you mow, you, you rotationally graze. I created artificial shade, um, uh, fertilize, unfertilize, and I can make some progress on lowering the concentration of sugar in my paddocks, but I cannot overcome the effects of cold temperature. When it's cold at night, there's nothing I can do uh, managing my pasture um, to get the sugar concentration low enough for a high-risk animal to graze. So you you just got to get them off during this time of year when it's cold at night. And and mm-hmm. let's remember, this is not just about spring grass. It's about cold grass. It happens in the fall again. Okay. Um, spring and the fall. The bottom line is, you know, you just got to restrict intake or get them off. Gotcha. And uh, that's just the kind of tough love. You know, it's like you you, you wish you could kill them with kindness, but you just can't. And you, you would if you let them graze, and especially, you know, insulin-resistant ponies. So we do appreciate everything. Unfortunately, we're going out of time. I'm sure we could talk about this for hours, and you guys are just so funny. Um <laughs> Uh, yes, horses will pee on the hay, but they'll also eat dirt. So eventually they will come around to eating the not-so-good-tasting, low-sugar hay, um, as proven by your ponies. So we do appreciate you being on, Katie, so much. And uh, where can people find out more about you? Okay, uh, my website is safergrass.org, O-R-G. And it's uh, not safe grass, it's safer grass, because as I pointed out, I can make it safer, but I can't make it completely safe. Right. And you, must have, run... you must have every leftover from the 60s finding your website and being very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess so. Safer grass. <laughs> <laughs> little I got you get a lot of hits that are not for, for, uh, for the purpose intended. It's not medical grade oh, yeah. marijuana, people. And it's it, safergrass dot org. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And, and if, if they want to learn more about this, I've got some presentation CDs on there. Uh, they're one hour lectures where I, I explain all this plant physiology, and and there's another CD on hol- holistic management, you know, of the uh, metabolically challenged horses. Um, and uh, a lot of people say they listen to them over and over and over again, and because a lot of these concepts are counterintuitive. Um, but uh, this is all based on science. You know, I've got I've got 24 kinds of grass and replicated pots in my backyard. So uh, you know, I, this is all scientifically based. Okay, fantastic. Safergrass.org. Thank you, Katie. And as obviously, thank you, Christy, so much. Everybody go to thehorse.com and you can read all about it. And it, since it is Laminitis Awareness Month, lemon, uh, thehorse.com forward slash laminitis, correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All, all right, right thanks, Christy. Guys. Well, I have some articles on Katie's work on there as well, and they'd, they'd be under our hay category. <clears throat> okay. okay, great. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you.
Okay, that was part two in the laminitis series that we're taking from Horses in the Borrowing from Horses in the Morning, putting it all together in a series here on Horse Tip Daily. Part of what we try and do on Horse Tip Daily is provide content from the various uh, shows that we do that we thought would be interesting to our Horse Tip Daily fans, especially I know that a lot of you don't get to listen to all the shows. So this way you you can catch what you do miss on, on some of the other shows. And if you've already heard it, you can just skip over it and go to the next one. Nice thing about podcasts. Well, we'll be back again tomorrow with another new expert and a different horse tip. Don't forget, Horses in the Morning is every morning, 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time at HorsesInTheMorning.com. The Horse Radio Network and the Horse Radio Network hosts are not responsible for statements of guests or their opinions. Use your own judgment when listening to the tips provided by the experts on Horse Tip Daily.